Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm glad you found the right room. Congratulations. Um, a few administrative things to uh, discuss before I welcome tonight's speaker. Uh, first off, um, obviously, many of you have been busy. Um, that's the binder of upstart um, executive summaries that we have received. Uh, there are 21. So there is indeed going to be a competition for the 12 spaces that get to go forward. Just to be clear on the, um, the process that we're following, uh, you should get uh, an email um, sometime before next week confirming that uh, we have indeed received your submission. Okay, that's first thing. Um, so if, if a week from now you haven't got that email, that's when you can panic. Um, there was, as you might expect, a fair flood late on Friday, so there's a slight chance that things may have got lost in the shuffle. Um, my next job, I will, everybody who competes gets assigned an advisor, and I know some of you are already working with advisors at Mars, so you will likely get that same advisor for continuity. Um, they will all, every one of you will get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with your advisor, uh, when that's all taken place, I'm going to sort of bring everybody together and we'll argue and we'll come up with uh, the final 12 who will get to go on to do their 10-minute pitch. Everybody who has submitted, though, gets to continue on, work with your advisor uh, on developing your plan, okay? Uh, so I, you know, the intent here is that everybody who has entered gets some value towards developing their business idea. Uh, but... 12 will get to go forward to do the pitch towards the 10K prize. Um, I'm not entirely sure how quickly I'm going to be able to organize all these meetings. I promise I will get back to you with who's going ahead and who's not as soon as possible. Okay? Uh, second thing, the continuing saga of the uh, unavailability of videos. Uh, we have a, a, um, a patch that is being installed. Uh, we're using a, um, a service called Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O, dot com. Um, there will be instructions on the Mars website as to how to go to get access to tonight's lecture and, and some of the other ones where our system appears to be failing us. Um, and for those of you who are trying, you know, will be applying for credit, there will be a mechanism whereby you will get credit for having viewed the video. Um, uh, I won't be here next week, um, but Charles Plant, one of my colleagues, will be lecturing. Uh, the title of his lecture um, is going to be What VCs Want and Why They Call It Vulture Capital. Um, I promise you it will, if you've ever seen Charles's blogs, this will be entertaining. Um, uh, and we will be back downstairs uh, tomorrow, uh, next week. Okay? Um, do want to welcome a new sponsor, uh, St. Joseph, Joseph Communication. Uh, they will be sponsor of, of the remaining Lived It lectures, of which tonight's is, is one. Um, you may not have heard of them, but you've probably heard of Toronto Life, uh, Ottawa Magazine, Canadian Family, and my all-time favorite, Wedding Bells Magazine. Um, so they are clearly a, uh, a significant player um, in uh, communications and in a variety of, of areas, and we are delighted that they have become a sponsor of the course. Uh, it's appropriate that it's a communications company because uh, tonight's speaker has had a significant role in that industry. Uh, and I want to welcome Mr. David Campbell uh, as tonight's speaker. Now, I have um, Mr. Campbell's CV here. Um, Can I leave now? <laughs> uh, and I'm going to try to, to, to do him justice, but, 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 but be brief. He's the chairman and president of TriCaster Holdings. Um, TriCaster invests primarily in new emerging telecommunication companies that develop and operate unique communication applications. Okay, sounds good. What that doesn't tell you is that 57 years ago, he founded um, Cable TV Limited in Montreal. Um, that's in 1952. And David, I'll be honest, I didn't know that cable went that far back. So if you want 
reality for this uh, business about you know investing in new emerging telecommunications he created a cable TV company back in the very earliest days he was the founder uh, they grew it over 20 years um, and one of the most significant things that I think they did they were the first cable TV company to televise NHL and CFL games um, so that's knowing where the market is um, he went on to create the Beaver People, one of Canada's first paging companies, got sold to Bell. Uh, then went on, created Combined Market Quotations, CMQ Communications, Inc., um, computer, computerized transmission of online stock market information. Uh, uh, jumped through a number of things, that got sold to Dow Jones. Then he went on to um, create International Teledata Group, which is a messaging systems company uh, providing enhanced messaging uh, services. And they operated Canadian corporate news and newswire service, uh, which got sold to uh, PIMS of England. And I presume that's not PIMS number one cup, but it's uh, uh, relative thereof. So um, that's a pretty impressive uh, career. Um, involved in uh, creating a number of novel businesses in telecom, uh, but that wasn't enough. Um, Mr. Campbell has been very active in uh, community and, and public institutions. Um, he's currently a trustee of the Art Gallery of Ontario and was its chair in 99-2000. He is a director of the Baycrest Centre, um, director of Canadian Technion Society, director of Canadian Society for the Weizmann Institute of Science, governor of the Mount Sinai Hospital, and a director of the Royal Conservatory. That doesn't even touch on the past directorships of the Toronto Symphony, Canadian Stage Company, and I will show you here, I've only highlighted a subset uh, to go through. Um, but as they say in late night advertising, there's more. Um, he has been very generous in, in, uh, in philanthropic activities. Um, he's don't, contributed to the Music Garden, Toronto Waterfront, uh, and then just giving you a flavor of the diversity here, the Sunnybrook Ophthalmology Department, um, a student scholarship exchange between U of T and uh, Central European U uh, University in Budapest, um, and the Energy Project at the Weizmann Institute. So that's a fairly eclectic and diverse range. Uh, and through the Vivian David um, uh, uh, Campbell uh, Foundation, they've been involved in a variety of other things and a lot of art-related activities. Uh, a couple of exhibitions, uh, Symbolist pro uh, Prints of Edvard Munch, um, and the Campbell Collection of Omar Ramsden uh, Silver. Um, as you might expect, this has been recognized. He is the recipient of two honorary doctorates, uh, the most recent one from U of T, and he is a member of the Order of Canada. Um, I think the last thing that I want to make, he has published a book, The Way of an Entrepreneur, Do You Really Need an MBA? And I sincerely hope that Tonight's lecture is not the way of the entrepreneur. Do you really need entrepreneurship 101? Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. David Campbell. Thank you very much. I didn't know who the hell you were talking about for a minute. But um, I also have to apologize because I'm the only one in the room wearing a tie. And uh, I can blame it on my wife. She said, you've got to wear a tie. So that's it. Um, uh, I, I really want to thank you for uh, inviting me to speak. Because after my few remarks, you may be sorry that you were curious enough to attend. Let's see what you can get out of what I have to say. First, let me congratulate you for making a decision to increase your knowledge. In today's society, the university degree is a beginning, not an end. Knowledge is power. However, it is only power if you know how to use it properly. I understand that the majority of you are members of the research community and are interested in issues relating to starting and growing a science and technological-based business. 
Allow me to suggest that before you consider starting such a business, that you make sure the subject or service you intend to offer is new, novel, unique, different, and needed. You must answer yes to at least one of those questions, or you're going into the marketplace with one hand tied behind your back. In your research, you may run across a situation where you will say, why hasn't someone done something about X? You can say that and think that, but if you don't do something about it, when it is, it is my opinion that if you don't do something about it, you're not a real entrepreneur. I'm described as an entrepreneur. Why? I don't know. I don't know what creates an entrepreneur. I think I was born this way. My life evolved into entrepreneurship because of need. And that need, of course, was to earn a living. The word need is very important for an entrepreneur in more ways than you can imagine. I'm going to give you several points. You want to be an entrepreneur? You have to identify a need to meet the and a service to meet that need. If you find a service to meet that need, you have to pursue it. You will be taking a risk, but remember, no risk, no reward. You have to research the marketplace. And you have to find out, is the need currently being met? If it is, then you ask, why haven't I heard about it? And is this an opportunity to suggest an improvement in an existing product? Or should I pass? In my opinion, if you decide to pursue an improvement, you will be taking an unnecessary risk when there are other areas you could pursue without that competition. I want you to know that I have to, I'm going to give you several points because I was interviewed just before I came here and they asked me a lot of very um, interesting questions. I'm sure I screwed the whole goddamn thing up, but but uh, you'll probably see the results later on. You must also, by the way, discuss your intentions with several people that you have confidence in. Do not work in a vacuum. You need interaction with others. You need their opinions. You need to understand how they think as well as how you think. And a real entrepreneur, remember, does not look for a job. They want to be their own boss. They are consumed with the idea of running their own show. They want to make the calls, and they're prepared for the falls. And yes, you have to be a partial nut to be an entrepreneur. But I'll tell you that it is exhilarating, and it's frightening. Nothing, though, will ever surpass the feeling you will get if you even have a small success. Think of it. You get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and you say, I did it myself. That's a great feeling. I've done it several times. I also had a few losses, which I won't even talk about. My field is sophisticated electronics and communications. In one of our company's conference rooms, we had a sign painted around the ceiling of the world room. It said, remember, we obsolete ourselves every Monday morning. And in our field, you become obsolete in 10 minutes because there's always something new coming up. And one of the things I do now on a regular basis is look at new ventures to invest in. When we assess a new venture, and determine that, it will, that we will commit funds, we ask ourselves three questions. One, we like it, we think it makes sense. We ask ourselves, can we afford to lose? If the answer is yes, then we can proceed. The second question is, 
we cannot afford to lose but still want to proceed, then we ask, can we afford the salvage? If we can afford the salvage, then we can proceed. Now, the third question, if we cannot afford the salvage, the loss, and we cannot afford the salvage, then if we proceed, we're betting the whole ranch. Don't do that. And we don't do that. A few years ago, I wrote a book. I think there's some of them here. Unfortunately, you're going to be forced to look at it. And the book is entitled, Do You Really Need an MBA? Made a big hit in the publishing world because you don't do negative titles. It said, Do You Really Need an MBA? With a subtitle, The Way of the Entrepreneur, in which I referred to A and B type personalities and then established the E type personality. And the E type is what I call entrepreneur type. You have to be identified and you are now being identified. You are all E types. I'd like to read directly though something for you which gives you an idea of some of the things I did. After I came out of the armed services, I got a job at Northern Electric. And I was working in the electronics department, writing up job reports. I sat with my supervisor, and we had all the departments come and report to us. And they would say, Department 16 did this, Department 17 did that. And my boss would turn to me and he said, write it down. And I wrote it down. This is before we had laptops and before we could do anything else. And at my first meeting, and I'm there only a week, I go to the first meeting and uh, the departments are reporting. And department, uh, the, my, my supervisor says, Department 900, report. And this person would report and he said, we did so many units, we did this, we did that. And he came to Department 961 and the man in charge of 961 stood up and he said, no production today, no production this week. And he sat down. And I looked at my boss and he said, write it down. So I wrote it down. And then all the other departments and finally I collated all this stuff and put it together and sent out a report. A week goes by and we have another meeting with the, all these same people go all the way through and gets to 961 again and this guy gets up and he says no production this week now remember <laughs> I've only been there a week so I said what the hell do you do all week <laughs> I said so he said you're going to get fired I said well I'd rather get fired than to stay here and take money under false pretenses which is what you're doing you're getting nowhere you're doing nothing he says you're going to get doubly fired I said you can't get fired twice Anyway, the meeting, <laughs> the meeting was over, and I went back to my desk, and uh, I started cleaning up my desk because I thought, you know, this is it. But uh, my, uh, my supervisor came to me, and he said, uh, you better go and see the works manager. Well, I figured this was it. I'm going to get fired. And I go to see the works manager, a very wonderful guy by the name of Cy Peachy, and he said to me, uh, I hear you're making waves. I said, I don't know what that means, except that he says, I know. But tell me, give me your version of what you, you did or what said. And I told him. This fellow got up twice and he said, no production. So he said to me, you're so smart. What the hell would you do if you were the supervisor of 961? I said, I'd find out why the hell there's no parts. So he turned to me and he said, well, then why don't you do that? I said... I need, by the way, this is very interesting. In those days, and I'm working for Northern Electric, which was part of the Bell system that, that made telephones. In those days, you had to have a written authorization to make a long distance telephone call. So I said, I said, I need an authorization. So he said, I'll give it to you. Uh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to call the supplier and find out. So he gave me the authorization, and I phoned, and there was a little company in Brockville, Ontario, that was making these parts. And I said, uh, uh, I have this, um, uh, you have, you're making part number X, 
and uh, I'd like to know uh, uh, how it's going. He says, well, we have 4,000 of them here. I said, well, ship them. He said, who the hell are you? So I said, well, uh, uh, Mr. Peachy gave me permission to call you. He said, uh, that isn't the question. How can you tell me to ship them? And he said, when the purchase order specifically says ship in its entirety. Because these were the days before on-time deliveries. They made a purchase order. It said 10,000. The manufacturer made 10,000 and shipped 10,000 instead of shipping them as they come. We've come... <laughs> Did I do that? Anyway, uh, I said, uh, I went back to Peachy and I said, look, he's got 4,000 of them and uh, he's not shipping because the PO says ship in its entirety. Um, I think you should change the PO and let him ship proportionately each time. So P.S., we, we got the PO's changed, we got the 4,000 coming, the line went on and um, the, um, Next thing I know, I'm, I get a call from uh, 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 Mr. Peachy to tell him that I'm now in charge of that department. My boss is being moved up to somebody else. Because in Northern Electric, things move this way. Never this way. So now I'm in charge of the department. And I have an assistant who writes the reports. So I call a meeting. Nobody comes to the meeting. I'm in the room all by myself. Nobody comes to the meeting. Nobody makes a report. So I said, what the hell can I do? I gotta, I gotta write a report. So I said, you know what? They didn't come, therefore they're not working. So I wrote a report and wrote every department, no production this week, no production this week, no production this week, no production. And I sent out to the reports. Well, within five hours, everybody was at my desk saying, what are you writing a report like that for when you know goddamn well we're working? I said, you didn't come to the meeting, you didn't report, as far as I'm concerned, you're not working. P.S. They all came next week. <laughs> and <laughs> a couple of weeks later, I got a call from Peachy, and he says, uh, you know, he said, you're, you're continuing to make waves. And he said, but he says, okay. And he said, let me tell you something. What you're doing is very important for Northern Electric. But he says, you cannot change the culture of this institution. And he said, your future is assured here. But he said, I'm sure we won't be able to keep you because you want to go like this. And in Northern, we go like this. And he was right. I, in turn, I'm sorry, am I not? OK? There we go. Um, so I, I have to tell you that working at Northern was an experience. Now, I must tell you something that my wife and I are very interested in music. And we decided, here I am working at Northern at $220 a month, which was a hell of a lot of money in those days. It's a, considered a fortune. And liking music, we decided that one day, maybe we should open a record shop. I wanted to sell records. I mean, that would be nuts, of course, to do that. But remember, this was in the late 40s. So I went to see R.C. Victor. And I, being a veteran and having all the qualifications of, of proper discharge, I said I was told that I would get some kind of a uh, welcome to go into business. And they said, we'd like to help you, except there's a shortage of shellac. Now, I don't know if you know, but in those days, records were made of shellac and carbon black. 78 RPMs were the kind of records that if you dropped it, it broke. And there was a shortage of shellac. And he said, we'd like to help you, but we have to service our own customers first before we start new ones. So I have to say to you, I can't serve you. So I went to Columbia and I got the same answer, and I went to DECA and I got the same answer. Now, I started to tell you that my wife and I like music, and we were part of a group called uh, the uh, Montreal Repertory Theater. It was in Montreal at the time. 
and um, we uh, used to go uh, two or three times a week to um, entertain uh, convalescing uh, soldiers. I was top banana, I was the comedian on stage, and my wife took care of wardrobes. Uh, and after any, any of these performances, we were generally invited to somebody's home uh, to thank us for the, for the work that we did. Uh, and uh, I, I tell you this story because uh, chance plays a big role sometimes. So one day, we had entertained soldiers, and we went to this man's home. And uh, I'm standing there with a drink, and uh, somebody, this man, who was the host, came over to me, and he said, thank you very much for giving us your time. Um, uh, what do you do in the daytime? I said, I work for Northern Electric. What do you do? And he said, uh, well, I run a company you probably never heard of called the Compo Company. I said, oh, yes, I know that company. You make Decca Records. He said, how the hell would you know that? I said, because I applied and you turned me down. He said, well, why did we turn you down? I said, because there's no shellac. He said, yes, that's right, there is no shellac. He said, tell me, did you go to R.C. Victor? I said, yeah. What did they say? I said, they said, no shellac. He said, yeah, that's right, there's no shellac. So he said, did you go to Columbia? I said, yes. He said, what did they say? They said, no shellac. He said, yeah, that's right, there's no shellac. I said, this conversation is getting us nowhere. You know? <laughs> he says, yes, it is. And he handed me his card, and he said, call my office tomorrow. I want to talk to you. And he walked away. I looked at the card, and the man's name was H.S. Berliner. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the record industry or not. But Emil Berliner, this man's father, patented the first flat record. He took the cylinder that normally was recorded on, the Edison cylinder, and he flattened it out and made records. And they were records made of shellac, pressed into shellac. And this man was so, uh, and by the way, Emil Berliner um, had as their motto, you know the little um, the, um, horn with the dog, which they sold the company to RCA Victor, and RCA took that horn and dog and kept it as theirs. So when you see that, that goes all the way back to just before the turn of the century, when the Berliner Gramophone Company started. So um, Emil Berliner, son, was HS, the man I was talking to. And I, I must tell you that I screwed up something here for you, okay? Um, he was so annoyed with his father for having sold the business because he wanted to continue. That when, he, when his father sold the business, he took his share and he went 24 hours later and started a company called the Compo Company and got the rights for Decca Records in Canada. You couldn't do that today in 24 hours because they'd have all kinds of restrictions on you, but that's what happened. So this is the man I'm talking to. So I go to his office the next day. He said to me, I want you to tell me exactly what happened when you went to RCA Victor. Now remember, he hated RCA Victor. And he would do anything to hurt RCA if he could. So I said, I went to RCA, asked them for records. They told me there's no shellac. And regardless of the fact that you're a service man, we cannot sell your records. Uh, he said, um, and then what did you do? I said, I went to Columbia. And they told me, no shellac. I'm repeating the whole damn story that I told him the day before. I'm like, you think he hadn't heard me, but he wanted to hear it. He loved to hear the story. <laughs> and then I told him, I went to your company. You turned me down also. Uh, there's no shellac. He said, yeah, that's right. There's no shellac. I, start, I started to say, wait a minute, we, we, we've been there. But instead of that, he said, now stop. I want you to listen and listen carefully. I want you to go back to RCA Victor. And I want you to ask for the rights to sell records. And I want you to at, tell me exactly what they say. I don't care what words they use, I want you to say, but he said, I want you to tell them one other thing. Tell them you're getting 50 records a month from us. 
I said, are you giving me 50 records a month? He said, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, you tell them that. So you understand, he was introducing me to the white lie, right? So I said, what? he said, nothing else, just come back. So I went to R.C. Victor, uh, and I'm standing in front of the same guy, and I said, I'd like to uh, go into the record business, I'd like you to supply me. He said, we've told you, there's no shellac. I said, I thought you might like to know I'm getting 50 records a month from DECA. And he looked at me, and he said, that son of a bitch, we'll give you 100 records a month. <laughs> then I walked out. I went back to Merliner, I sat in his office, he said, now tell me exactly what went on. So I said, every, he says every word. So I said, that son of a bitch, we'll give you a hundred records a month. So he says, I thought, I, he said, I thought that's what they would say. Now he says, I want you to go to Columbia. And now you can tell them you're getting a hundred records a month. The other ones you were saying, you were, I say you were getting. I'm telling you the truth now, you're getting a hundred records a month. So I went to Columbia. And I said, they said, no shellac. I said, well, I thought you'd like to know that RCA are giving me 100 records a month. He said, those bastards will give you 200 records a month. And then I went back to Berliner and I said, this is the story, and I said, now they'll give me 200. How many will you give me? He says, well, you learn fast. We'll match them. And that's how we got into the record business. I tell you the story because you have to have a little luck sometimes. Now. I've bored you with all this nonsense. I'll throw the session open to questions. I'm sure I can't answer them, but let's, let's find out. Okay, could I just, um, for those on the microphone, I just ducked out there. Yeah. There's an overflow room next door. Oh, is there? Uh, but there are no microphones there. So if the people next door are listening, come on over <laughs> uh, and you can get your questions in here. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering what the one of your failures. Well, we have a lot of those. <laughs> Listen, as long as they're under 50%, it's okay. <laughs> um, you have to know when to fish and cut bait. Um, it's a very hard decision to make. Very hard. Because you've invested all this, you know. Um, but um, we've had some. If, if they were all 100%, uh, I'd be a multimillionaire. We had some failures, of course we had. But you have to go on, go into something else. And um, there is one, by the way, if you get a chance, I shouldn't be doing this to tell you that you should buy my book because uh, uh, that means I'm, I'm being very commercial, which I am, of course. So um, you, um, you, you find a lot of things in here exactly about the stories I told about, about uh, Mr. Berliner, because he became a mentor to me. And you must have a mentor. And as far as your question is concerned, failures, we've had them. Right now, we, we are, I should say, um, my small group, and I really only have three people now. We used to have 250. We are now working on three new products needed products. And if I asked any of you in this room, name me a product that's needed. You may have some trouble, but I can tell you, every day I get up, I, I think of a new idea. I don't know why. For, and one of them, by the way, just was shot down in this morning's paper. But, I, but, but for example, as you know, you all have uh, Blackberries, or you have cell phones, and you have items that have to be charged. And the manufacturers, God bless them, have those chargers each with a different tip. Right? So if you have a BlackBerry and you have an iPhone or something else, a, a, a laptop or something, and you have to have different chargers for all these items. And I said, hey, product, universal charger, so that you can have all these tips all on one charger. And today, the um, cell phone people in their, at their conference made an announcement that in the year 2012, they're going to have one charger only. 
are all cell phones. So that one goes down the drain. You asked me about failures. We didn't get very far with that one, but it could be a failure. What can I tell you about failures? What, has that answered your question? Well, Lord, um, a lesson learned from that. David, can I ask you to repeat the question? The, the, the oh, gang yeah. in the room next door, they can hear your answers yeah. fine, but they, yeah. can't, they have no idea what the questions are. Uh, okay. the, you want to tell the question again? Let's hear about one of your failures. That was the question. Well, of course, I have a strange personality. I forget my failures very quickly. <laughs> because if I didn't, I'd have ulcers by this time. <laughs> uh, I, I really, yes, we've had failures. But seriously, um, uh, I don't remember them. Uh, because I make a point of never remembering failure. I love success. And um, because if I, if I ruminated about the failures, I wouldn't get on to the next subject. We don't have time for that. We move very quickly. You're in a fast-moving society. We obsolete ourselves every Monday morning. Enjoy it. So you had a failure. What the hell? Move on. I'm sorry. That's the best answer I can give you. So you don't pick up a lesson from that? From not, not with my personality. Because I'm, I'm a nut, so I don't know. Uh, 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 well, hey, maybe you could take something out of it because uh, uh, you went into an area that you didn't know anything about. Um, um, but it's a failure. What the hell are you going to do about it if you failed by ruminating about it? Move on. Move on to something else. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, can you define the youth personality? Pardon? Can you define the youth personality that you mentioned earlier? Good question. Sorry, could you repeat it? Yeah, can you, could you define the E personality? Well, I think I, I, uh, I mentioned a couple of the things that you have to do to, uh, to be an e-personality, um, uh, to find the product, pursue the product, um, and uh, to want to be your own boss, I think, is perhaps the greatest thing that uh, uh, an e-personality can have. Um, uh, listen, uh, if you read uh, my book, I started... Uh, being a, I hate that word, but I, uh, I guess a neat personality, if you want to say it. So when I was in high school, um, because I noticed um, um, one day there was a store uh, right near the near the high school where I went uh, that was selling um, school supplies, and I noticed a, a truck used to come every week to this store and deposit the school supplies. And all of my uh, fellow students would go there and we'd buy books and so forth. So I said, wait a minute. This can't be the only guy he sells to. So the next time he came to the store, I went to him and I said, who else do you sell to around here? He said, nobody. I said, how would you like to sell to me? He said, of course. So I became a competitor to the store near the high school. I was persona non grata, of course, from then on in the store, they wouldn't let me in. So I start selling scribblers and I start selling pencils and a few things that everybody needed. Maybe it was there that I was born an E-type personality. I w but I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to be my own boss. And I wanted to make my own mistakes. I make mistakes. I am not perfect. Unfortunately, everybody makes mistakes. But move on. Don't ruminate about it. Get going. Yes. Yes. Could you share some thoughts on uh, forming partnerships, picking partners and forming partnerships? <sighs> well, um, I'm going to give you an example of, of partnerships which might help you. 
One of the companies that we sold I had uh, 250 employees. And I felt that the uh, uh, main engineering people should be part of this company because if everything worked the way it should work, one day somebody's going to want to buy the place and therefore everybody should participate. So I gave everybody a small piece of that company. I set aside 10% of the shares. This was not a public company. This was a private company. And then one day, somebody came in and said they want to buy the company. And the price was right. So I called everybody together who had shares, and I said, we've got a buyer here. I thought you'd all like to know. By the way, every one of those fellows in the room each made over a million dollars. They all participated. However, before that happened, one person in the room stood up and said, I'm not selling. But I said, wait a minute. The buyer wants 100%. And if you don't sell, we can't consummate this deal. He said, I don't care. I'm not selling. So I, we called the meeting off, and I said, I want to talk to you. He said, yeah, I want to talk to you, too. So the two of us were in the room together, and I said, you know you're a whore, eh? So he says, yeah, but I don't want to sell. I said, why? He says, because I want more than that price. He said, I said, you want more than anybody else, right? So he told me how much more he wanted. I said, you're not only a whore, you're a prostitute. <laughs> I said, I'll pay it. And I did. I paid it out of my share. And it taught me a lesson. You can give equity monetary value, but not the voting rights. You know the difference, I'm sure. You all know the difference. Somebody wants to buy the company, they want all the shares and the voting shares. But if this person has only the monetary value and you have his votes, you control. So that's one way of doing a partnership. Make sure you have control. If they won't, if you won't get the voting control, get written authorization to have their shares, the votes of their shares. Does that help you? Next. Who's that? Pardon? Sorry? Credibility. Credibility. Is important. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now you just said with your record company, you were white black, right? With my record company? I told a white lie. Yes, of course I told a white lie. But then if you, if the person didn't tell you that you could tell the white lie, would you actually say it to get the shares? I mean, to get the record? I think so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Do you have the knowledge that those two companies are fighting each other? You mean RCA and Columbia and things like that? Or what companies are you talking about? Uh, well, they were competitors in the, in the field, except that they had different labels, uh, different artists on their labels. So they competed, but RCA, for example, was mostly classic. DECA was mostly pop. And, uh, for example, Frank Sinatra from Bing Crosby was, was on the DECA label. And, uh, what if they didn't trust you and said they found out you were lying? Pardon? What, what if they didn't trust you and they found out that you were lying? Well, I guess they kicked me out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worry about that. <laughs> I, I got enough things to worry about. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about uh, your recent waves at Michael Michael. Yeah. And I was wondering how do you distinguish, like, um, to some degree, the people who were writing up in their report? Yeah. Are you asking, how do I find loyal people? Yes, that's part of it, and how do you decide when to, you know, when that's Well, um, relationships are every day. You can tell by dealing with people. And you get a gut feeling. Yes, I can trust this person. No, I can't. And if you can't, m cut the relationship right then and there because you're just wasting time. 
You're absolutely wasting time. And time is very valuable. And also, a person that you can't trust will tear down the whole organization. Get rid of them. Get them going. Sure, there are times when I have to be a son of a bitch. And I am. But it's for the good of everybody. Yeah. Whoops. Mentorship? Yeah. Yes. So would you say that you should find a mentor that you can stick with forever, or should you find that mentor based on the venture that you're trying to do? Can those people hear that question? Uh, no. So, sorry. Um, well, should you find a mentor based, uh, a mentorship or uh, a mentor for life, or should you find a mentor based on the type of venture that you're okay, so pursuing? For the benefit of the folks next door, if you're finding a mentor, should it be someone for life? Or, or should you evolve and change mentors as, as you and your business evolve, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, the, um, the mentor you pick does not necessarily be the mentor you use on every venture. Because some people are specialists in something, some people are not. Um, the, um, um, I was fortunate. I had... Uh, H.S. Berliner as a mentor. I had a man by the name of A.L. Laws who uh, 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 was president of the, ran a company called uh, Montreal Shipping. <laughs> I, I, I always remember when he came in to me one day and he said, because uh, I, I just told you the story, but he said to me, you look worried. And I said, no, I'm not. He says, I can don't tell me that. He says, I can tell by looking at you, you're worried. He said, and, and he said, I can tell you what you're worried about. I said, okay, what am I worried about? Now, this was during the time of the Korean War. And he said, you're worried about whether you should buy inventory or not now. And he was dead right. Now, I gave you the answer, of course. He said, there's three questions you have to ask yourself. And can you afford to lose? And you can't afford to lose or you're betting the whole ranch, don't do that. That's where that phrase came from, by the way, from him. Now, he was a mentor. He uh, uh, often came into the shop. He uh, uh, made suggestions. Uh, when I went into the cable business, um, by the way, he, uh, uh, he was married to a, uh, a Russian pianist. He happened to be the uh, uh, ambassador to Russia for Canada for many years, and he came back. He had married this, this lady in, in uh, Russia. And um, he had come to me uh, in our record department. He was uh, buying records. And one day he said, I'd like you to help me. Um, I want to record my wife. And she's a pianist. And I want you to help me set up a recording studio in my house. Which I did. I helped him do all that. But um, as a result of doing that, he uh, came to me one day also. <laughs> Um, I don't think this is in the book, but they said to me, uh, I want to buy a, uh, what is now known as high fidelity uh, piece of equipment. And he said, uh, I want you to go to Chicago at my expense and go to the Harmon Carden people and buy an amplifier for me. I had never been on an airplane. He said, I'll pay the ticket and so forth. And he said, I'll tell you how much to spend. And he said, I want you to go and do it. Will you do it? I said, of course. So he got, I got the ticket. Um, and I went to Harmon Carden. And uh, he told me what it was going to cost because he had already spoken to them. He said, I want you to see if it's OK and tell them to ship, which I went. I went to Chicago, went to Harmon Carden. And I came back, and I told them. And everything came in. And he said, what do I owe you? And I said, uh, nothing. You paid for the air trip. He says, let me tell you something. Don't ever do anything for nothing. You spent time. You're entitled to a return. I'm going to pay you. I said, he said, how much? I said, I don't know what to charge you. He says, I'll tell you what you're worth. And tell me if you think it's not enough. Well, he, he made a figure, and I said, it's, I accept. <laughs> you know? so, and he, he, that's the kind of mentor you need. 
because he tells you the little things. H.S. Berliner told me about, uh, we used to go into the recording booths and listen to the records of the competition. And he would say, listen to that, hear that tick? I didn't know what the hell he was listening for until he showed me how to listen. That's important. Um, I've had other people who have helped um, answer your question. I don't think one mentor is enough. I think you find mentors for many things, and you find many people. And there are a lot of very wonderful people out there that are willing to help. They don't want to get paid. They really like to share their knowledge. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Anything else? Can I go to bed now? OK. One last thing. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Seat. Oh yeah. Uh, there are five um, post-it notes distributed around the room. If you've got a post-it note, you get a copy of the book. So, uh, oh. would you um, <laughs> would you join me in thanking Mr. Campbell? <laughs>